listening to The Starting Zone, a podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft, the people who play it. Today is November 27th, 2022, and my name is Spencer Downey. Uh, thank you so much for joining and listening to the podcast. I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host, Jason Lucas. Jason, we're not here alone. We brought Indeed. along our friend of the show for our launch episodes, as we have been doing, I think, for three or four expansions now. <laughs> Something like that at this point. Indeed, yes. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I think it's I think this is three in a row, so uh, welcome back to the show, uh, Twitch streamer, main tank for BDGG. It's Mr. Salute. Salute, how are you doing? I'm low. I'm good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of become a tradition at this point, so it's good to be back for another one. Oh, we're getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kidding. But uh, welcome back. It's so so happy to have you. And uh, you know, anytime there's new stuff coming out, we always like to pick your brain about it because you're one of the guys who's in there really digging deep and, and living in that pre-release content, whether it's betas, alphas, PTRs, what have you. So always love to hear your insights and and to let our audience know, you know, stuff they should be paying attention to, or maybe stuff there should that should be on their mind as they start diving into the you know the new stuff in the game. Yeah, great to have you, man. Nope, you're all muted there. Oh, good to be here, gentlemen. Thank you. I had a little bit of a... <laughs> yeah, no, understandable. understandable. Yeah, so for, for, for those who are curious about Salute sounding slightly different, uh, it is entirely because he's a little sick, which is, you know, mm. perfectly lined up for the launch of Dragonflight. <laughs> what, what better way to celebrate, like I said? Oh, man. Uh, all right, but let's uh, let's start off, Jason. We're going to do uh, uh, a, little, a little chat around... I guess, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on with you in the past with the last week of Shadowlands? Are we have to cover like yeah. the last week so that people know I, what I, we did? Yeah, I mean, it's always kind of a weird one, right? Like when you get into this kind of lame duck phase of an expansion and it's like, well, there's still stuff you want to do or you have sort of stuff on the calendar with, with your homies or something. You know, you want to do some WoW stuff, but like a lot of it's just straight up not worth it. Um, we did end up having a raid night. Also, it's like, you know, a big holiday week in the, in the States. So that cuts into the schedule as well but we did we did some heroic raid um for one night uh, doing quadruple faded which is just hilarious you know you spend you spend the whole fight just reacting to the faded affixes we sat down on tuesday and i'm like all right guys uh what do we want to do you know anything's on the table it's the last night of heroic which we do it what i heard was like three or four people in a row just say sylvanas <laughs> which i think was a personal attack they just wanted me to have to go do sylvanas <laughs> more time. Like, so we went we did like the sanctum unlock skip and went and did sylvanas no bow of course we had we had our uh we had our hunter buddy who never managed to get a bow in season two or season four come one more time just to maybe try to kill the meme but the meme will live on forever at this point uh no bow we went and did Jailer and finished off the night that way. So that was kind of a fun way to send off Heroic Raid. Um, ended up doing like one keystone for the night, you know, for the week, which just for the hell of it. Um, did a little uh, workshop. We did like a 21, which was cool because it was a little bit of raiding for me. And uh, one of the people we brought along, somebody from Guild, ended up getting the Mechagon Teleport. They hadn't done a workshop that high. So that was nice. Nice. Um, other, other than that, my big thing is just like, dude, I have gone on a spree of just cleaning up inventories. Like everything is gone. Now. <laughs> I, I went, I went and got my, all my Paragon bags. So I didn't, uh, you know, I, I did a lap and anything that was still sitting around, I picked up. I got everything out of the reagent bank. Like anything from Shadowlands is, is gone. And anything I'm picking up goes right on the auction house. I got all my irrelevant gear out of the way. You know, I was still hanging on to the Zareth Mortis zone gear just in case I felt like messing with it. I'm never going back there now. So I don't need that anymore. Anything that was like sub 304 or 298 went out the door um, since, you know, with set bonuses and all the changes with legendaries and everything, it, they're not going to, it doesn't matter anymore. So that I got rid of all that stuff. I did my last round of the conservatory. I'll pick it up tonight. I trashed all my seeds and all the catalysts and all that. Uh, just everything. I, this is as clean in terms of inventory as, as I've gone <laughs> into an expansion ever. I've never done this before. It feels nice to see like triple digits of extra bag space in a character, let me tell you. So... Um, Can't imagine. Yeah, it didn't really. Uh, tonight we have the all paladin raid coming up. We're gonna do normal whatever. I guess start in Athria and just play normal mode raid with faded affixes and everybody on paladins, and it'll be fun. I, I hope enough people come out that we can have a good time and just, you know, just do something wacky, a little off the wall, and and have fun with the guild. Shadowlands was rocky for everybody, right? Like, certainly had its ups and downs. And um, I appreciate everybody who stuck it out with us and with the group and and kept showing up through thick and thin. So. 
we'll send it off and, and have like just a, a loose night of, of messing around and doing paladin stuff so that'll be cool i always look forward to those at the end of an expansion yeah salute in case you didn't know jason always ends off the last raid of the expansion with a one class raid that's the that's their goal oh the that's the tradition yes so they've done Druid, they've done Paladin. Or they, have you done any of the other ones? Well, we did Monk. Monk yeah, right. we went yep. we went Paladin, Druid, Monk. So now we're back yeah. around to Paladin. So, yeah. Uh, now we got to figure out. There was a suggestion that we do Demon Hunters and Evokers only. And it's like two classes, but everybody's flappy. And it was like, well, maybe <laughs> next time. We didn't, we didn't have the information, right? I told everybody when Shadowlands <laughs> came out, level a Paladin at some point during the expansion for all Paladin raid. But now we can, we can schedule appropriately, maybe for Dragonflight. Right. But I know, Ted, you've been doing nonstop prep this past week. What is what is your week in World of Warcraft look like this past week? Oh, God, where to begin? <laughs> um, or where to end, rather? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, uh, so obviously, I mean, I have a lot of Race World First stuff. So there's this, there's this weird kind of divide all the time. And it has been for years for me where, you know, because I'm a streamer, I want to do everything online and, you know, mingle with the community for tanking, for whatever. On the flip side, I got to, like... You know keep some things under wraps and, and hide stuff so there's was this weird situation so there's a lot of that stuff you know spreadsheeting and theory crafting and tank analysis and hitting dummies for more hours than i'd like to admit and um but you know on the flip side all the other stuff online um and he just reminded me i haven't cleaned my bags out yet and i just looked at my paladin's bags and i'm a little scared um but so i got to do that and you know, wanted to do the um the pre-patch stuff because that kind of stuff for me is like it's always a bit of a pain in the butt, but you know you do, you're going to regret it later, right? If you don't do it, all those like one-time items it just takes a few, you know, a couple hours. Did all that, um, week orders, like I said, and then um, just kind of getting ready, getting tunes ready, you know, cleaning out the quest log, all the usual once every two years kind of thing. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it now. Nice, yeah. For those who don't know, if you uh, hop into Salute's community, you can. Uh... Uh, well, if you join it, and in some cases, if you sub, you can get access to weak auras and a lot of his UI elements and things like that that he custom makes. So in some cases, there's custom images that he uses or sounds that he uses in some cases. So there's, uh, there's some special stuff there. It's fun to play around with. Uh, for myself, this past week, and wow, man, um, I reevaluated what I was wanting to do with Shadowlands. I've been going over it for a little while. My work schedule has been bonkers because of, uh, well, we're understaffed by two people at the moment. So I've been... I've been doing the um the active swapping of shifts for i think four months now where i've been trying to continuously move shifts around to try and make sure i always had time for raid attendance we've got a whole bunch of programs running in the evening now which really sucks um and so i decided that i was actually going to drop back from a, a main um first first string position with our team and just sort of take on a backup role if i could for a little bit while we sort all that out so uh i'm still playing wow i'm still gonna be hopping in dragonflight right off the bat but i'm in less of a oh my goodness i have to gear up immediately and be totally prepared and study everything kind of mode uh which i think will be kind of nice i did uh, i've been doing the the mythic rating scene um in a fairly serious way for the last four and a half years so it's kind of like hey i guess since it's been that long maybe i should take a little <laughs> little break for a little while probably okay to do um so i might take this tier a little bit more casual and see where we're at when we're coming into the next chunk of the tier uh, which has meant that this past week was pretty much just spent chatting with people and hanging out with people and not really raiding things. Our, our team didn't raid this past week to give everyone the, the time off for a break and prep and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's neat to sort of be able to contribute to strategy and conversation inside of the Discord without at the same time being like, I need to make sure that I am 100% on top of every little min-max thing I can do for my class so I can put even more time into planning, which I think will actually be kind of helpful to the team overall. So it's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. My plans for Dragonflight is to uh, hop in. We'll see what tomorrow looks like. Uh, last expansion launch, uh, <laughs> it was such massive server overload, it was practically unplayable on the incredibly high pop slash full servers um, for the first little bit at launch. So I'm curious as to what that's going to look like, but I know for sure Tuesday, Wednesday is going to be spent um, actually playing with Robin, who's going to be hopping in and playing with me. So we'll be <laughs> leveling stuff up. Nice. It's a good time. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Wow. Huh. All right. Well, yeah. um, I mean, we do have a little bit of what's going on this week in WoW, so we'll we'll play the sounder, and then we will sort of dive into Dragonflight stuff uh, after going over the couple of things we know that are happening this next week. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so the things that we know are happening is that there's currently a brawl on the calendar and it's packed house. And so that's basically your arenas, except with 15 versus 15 teams. It's nutty and kooky and silly and very fast. So if you're looking to make some fast honor, which probably would be not a bad thing in the first week of, uh, of uh, a new expansion. Um, if this is in fact happening, it's on the calendar. That's why we're mentioning it. Uh, it's a good way to sort of hop in, do the something different quest, get some shenanigans with the 15 versus 15 and make some honor and conquest, which would be good for everybody. Yeah, I, I'm I'm wondering if maybe the brawl might run, but the quest might not be available or something. The conquest, I think, would be the sticking point here that I could see them not dishing out next week. So I guess we'll find out. We don't know right now, but it is on the calendar as of this writing. And Packed House is one of those that there's really not a lot of technique, right? It's just a big mess, just two huge arena teams smashing into each other. So it could be pretty fun with your, you know, your level 70 stuff and your, 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 final max level builds and all that finally kicking in. That could be a good time. It could also just be a big mess, but um, I guess we'll see. It is, it is the only event on the calendar for the week. We don't have like a weekly event, you know, keystones aren't going to be open. There's no world boss, that kind of stuff that we run down every week. First yeah. week of the expansion is just kind of ramp up into, you know, go check out the new zones, level up and, and kind of get used to the new routine. Yeah, we will mention that Dark Moon Fair is in fact going on uh, according to the calendar as well. And it should based off the schedules they try and keep. So that'll be December 4th until the 10th. That week, you'll be able to head on down to the Dark Moon Fair. And I mean, there's there's trading cards back now as well. So we don't know if that's going to you know be something that people are hopping into that early or whether they're just going to disable that stuff. But keep your eye on that. Uh, obviously, the buff for extra reputation gain and extra experience gain from riding on the carousel or riding on the roller coaster. Those are both important things to grab um, for those pet battlers out there. You know, there's, I'm sure there's people who want to get more pet battle tokens for all the new stuff that's going to be coming out that you're going to be able to pick up. Um, there's still the racing there. There's still the concerts. There's professions. Let's remember everyone's doing professions again. So you're going to want your cooking and your fishing and your alchemy and everything else. Um, you get your free skill ups. Uh, that was something that uh, I know they converted over to being something different um, previously where it was just leveling up the baseline stuff. But it's worth trying to see what happens with you know, the new profession system, whether or not Dark Moon Fair is in fact granting skill ups for the new profession system would be a great thing to check on. Um, yeah, so I like it, you know, worthwhile checking out, but wanted to cover those two things real quick before we dove entirely into what's going on in Dragonflight. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it's going to work with the professions, but if it does anything for Dragonflight professions, and this is amazing Dark Moon Fair timing, so, uh, we'll have to check it out and report back next week. Um, it, I hope so, because it's like, all right, you you know, Dark Moon Fair starts on, what, like day six after the expansion comes out, basically, right? So you have all that time to get appropriately sweaty, level yep. up your, your tunes, and just know life that however you want to. And then when you kind of come out of that fugue state, you can start thinking about getting your professions in order and then head over to Dark Moon Fair. It seems like really good timing if it works like that. Yeah. All right, as far as Dragonflight goes, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the, the brief little recap here of, you know, new level cap, level 70. We're going to the Dragon Isles. There's going to be Dragon Riding. Um, we got major factions, you know, different new factions that you're going to be able to sort of pick up and learn and gain experience with. Uh, we've got eight new dungeons. Uh, we got the, the new raid coming out. That's going to be December 12th is when the, the first launch of that happens. And they're launching Heroic and Mythic at the same time, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so that's going to be a, a different thing, which obviously all these things I'm talking about, we're going to dive into deeper. I'm just sort of doing the recap up front. Um, the new professions system, the, uh, the, um, new way of actually selling and, uh, acquiring profession crafted gear with trade contracts. Uh, we got, uh, the actual crafting process being more in depth with a lot of different tertiary stats and, and other aspects to how you craft being affected by that. Are you being able to sort of force them in a certain way, which is kind of neat. Um, there's just, there's so much happening in this, but let's, let's start piecing this down a little bit. So let's start off with, uh, dragon riding salute. How important is dragon riding going to be to your leveling experience in this? Uh, well, um, very important, but both from the perspective of, you know, just moving quickly from place A to place B. Um, also side note, I guess, side note, a part two, uh, it's very fun. All right. Super fun. Um, but the difficulty is going to be the auto follow, right? For anybody who's multi boxing, oh, yes. including myself. Um, I know, I actually don't know where they're going to settle for live, but when they first launched it, um, especially for accessibility features, they made it so that you can opt to be a whelp and auto follow somebody who gets on their proto dragon and rides. And that was meant to be group uh, party wide. And then they changed it to only one passenger. 
to my understanding. I don't know what their final version is going to be. I think the version right now is still the one passenger, uh, which bodes poorly for me as triple boxing. So there's going to be a poor odd man out somewhere. Um, but overall, important, fun, etc. Um, I think it's honestly the feature that I was I expected least out of. Not in a negative way, but when they first mm-hmm. advertised it, I was kind of like, meh, meh. You know, what, what about the talents? What about the dungeons? What about whatever? Um, and it's the one that blew me the most away when I tried it and played with it. It's just fun, man. It is. It's just good old fun. Yeah, it, it yeah, certainly is. I had the same reaction, you know, when they did the big reveal back in, what was that, April already? It, it seems like a really long time ago. Um, it was like, uh, they just, it, you know, it was like, okay, well, there's like physics-based flying. You have a dragon, whatever. I'm like, okay, fine. Like, I don't care. Does this, you know, does this make my character stronger? Like, does it, does the number go up? Then I, whatever. Um, and then as soon as we got a chance to mess with it back in, in alpha, I was like, it feels so natural and it feels so, uh, connected to like the level design and the outdoor zones, you know, it, they, they kind of tee it up for you where you kind of end a quest chain at the top of this, you know, cliff or whatever. And then you can see the next place you need to go to and you want to just drag and ride all the way over there. It's like, it's so fun and it's so dynamic compared to traditional wow flying and, the other really cool thing about it is it's a great vector for collectibles because you can spec out your dragon to look like all kinds of different stuff. You know, you can make a dragon that looks the way that you want it to, and then you can change it, you know, when you when you feel like it's time to change it. It gives them a way to introduce rewards that you can unlock because you can get appearances for your, your dragon riding drakes, you know, via other activities in the game. Um, you have the ability to kind of get more uh traits i forget what they call them there's like the talent system essentially for your for your dragons where you can get more vigor and everything like that so you can stay in the air longer you can get back into the air more quickly after you run out of vigor you can get other cool bonuses and you find you you get those by finding items in the world that unlock them which is more along the lines of like an action type game it makes me feel like you know, the thing I guess I would compare it to that I played the most is like the Batman Arkham games kind of, right? Where you have that sort of physics, you know, momentum-based transport system, and then you can improve it by, you know, performing certain things in the world or finding rewards out in, in sort of like a an open or a, a pretty, you know, large level design type of space. So I think I think it's really cool. And the other thing is it's not, it doesn't seem like it's tied to any kind of gating or anything. It's not like you have to wait a couple weeks for dragon riding to start unlocking or whatever, or there's some quest chain you have to play all the way through that rolls out piecemeal. It's like you can get in here you start doing this pretty early, at least in the beta leveling process. Like you get introduced to it pretty early on. And then if you want to go find all the collectibles and, and max out your dragon riding, you can do that. Like when you have the, you know, the time and the motivation to go do it. And if you don't really want to worry about it, then the opportunity cost is low, right? Like, if your dragon riding isn't as good as your buddy's dragon riding, well, if you don't care about that, it's not really going to impact your experience when it comes to playing PvP or raids or dungeons or whatever. It's strictly for outdoor world transit and just having stuff to collect and show off. So it, it seemed like such a throwaway in the in the uh, you know the the intro video and in the announcement piece, but really, like the more I think about it, I think this is a great addition for. Uh, especially for players who are a bit more on the casual side or more kind of focused on like outdoor world play, solo play. If that's where you get a lot more of your rewards from, if that's where your playtime and and your fun really kind of lives, I think dragon riding is an awesome feature for those types of players because there's so much you can do with it and you can be rewarded totally within that system. You know, I mean, obviously there's going to be stuff from, there might be collection uh, rewards from other places, but you'll be able to collect plenty of stuff from going through the renowned systems and everything like that. So, yeah, it's it's it, I think it's something that even even people who are like really hardcore players and want to do high level content, you're going to want to interact with this because it's going to save you time and it looks cool and it's just fun to float around in the dragon. It's it's it really just it ticks so many boxes for me. Yeah, it's uh, it's. It's certainly a system that, as as you said and as Salute said, it, I was not expecting a lot from, and I certainly am enjoying quite a bit. Uh, all right, leveling, because we we definitely touched on leveling there. You're triple boxing. Uh, I think you actually do this twice, don't you? You do, it, you do it one time through with one group of tanks, another time through with another group. You do it three times? Where, where are we at now with this? It might, it, it might get a little spicier this time. It might yeah. be three or four rounds this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
Yeah, there's a lot of time spent on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there is. Uh, is there any tips or tricks that you're planning on, you know, deploying that might not be quite as obvious for the average player when it comes to leveling stuff up? Um, honestly, nothing crazy. I haven't been, I know there's, you know, over the expansions, it's the, the kind of scene of, you know, world first X level <clears throat> has kind of, excuse me, uh, has kind of developed and, you know, taken off. Um, I mean, we had it all the way back in, you know, MOP with the theme and all those kind of guys. Um, but Outside of that, you know, outside of any crazy strats, I mean, there was crafting abuse, but they nerfed that. There was, you know, some mobs that people always find that give obscene amounts of XP, sit there for three hours farming them nonstop, and they kind of nerfed a lot of those. I'm sure the guys that are going for that kind of thing have something up their sleeve because nobody wants to share their, you know, strat for that, And uh, much like, you know, race to world first with raiding. Um, but for me, personally, a lot of it is just the usual basic stuff. You know, prepare if I, since I'm multi boxing, prepare macros on everyone that's just slash follow the main guy you're running around on. Right. You know, um, you know, make sure your every little bit adds up. Get your food buffs, get your flasks, get your whatever min maxi kind of stuff. Because when you're doing, you know, two, three, four rounds of tunes or just even two, three, four tunes, like that stuff adds up and saves you time. Um, other than that, probably just a combination of questing and crafting. They didn't nerf crafting into the ground, you just kind of really abuse it all the way through uh, to level 70 anymore it's more of like a two to three level jig now i would say oh okay uh yeah i i, I know a lot of especially during um battle for azeroth and then the beginning of shadowlands people using movement speed potions being a really big thing that they really like to just stock a ton of and use to try and get from mob to mob to mob as fast as possible um it's it's an interesting challenge for players who who want to put the effort into it but uh, it's not, you know, you're, you're talking about, in some cases, saving a couple hours at most mm -hmm. kind of idea. You're not talking about, hey, this is going to make or break whether or not you can keep up with everybody else. It's uh, an interesting thing, though, because I know a lot of people are hoping to hop on Monday night, level to max level on at least one of their characters Monday night before the reset happens on Tuesday. So they can actually accomplish some things at max level uh, on sort of Monday mm -hmm. morning, Tuesday morning before reset happens. And try and get that quote unquote week ahead, if you will, on some reputations and things like that. Is that something you're pushing for? Yeah. I mean, a lot of that stuff is not because they've unlinked a lot of player power from, you know, renown and stuff for the most part, at least, and, you know, reps, et cetera. It's nothing too crucial. Like it wasn't like, uh, you know, getting a swoop in of Azrite power and BFA or whatever it might be that, that really pushes that player power. So it's a little less appealing, I suppose, but. There's still advantages that come with it, especially for crafting a bit. Um, but yeah, to a certain extent, I mean, depending how many tunes you're going to have, there's no way you're going to, like, you're not going to be able to get four or five rounds of leveling in before the reset. So yeah, yeah, it's something I would go for. I don't want to say, though, on the flip side, you know, contrary to what we're talking about, all these little tips and tricks. Yeah. Um, if you're not in a rush to hit that max level to squeeze that pre-reset stuff in, I would just take the time and enjoy the leveling, man. I mean... One thing I got to say, I'm, I'm a big stickler about how the zones look and new expansions. And these are some nice zones. Like, I think Azure Span is probably contender for one of my favorite zones already. And I haven't spent that much time in it yet, you know? So, I mean, just soak it in. It only happens once, right? Every, once every two years you get this. Yeah. No, I, I agree entirely. It's, it's one of the reasons why I'm enjoying that I'm taking a step back a little bit more of this tier is I can actually go, yeah, you know what? Rob and I can sit down, we can sort of go through it in our own pace and have fun and enjoy it and explore it. And one of the first things Jason and I commented about when we were hopping into the alpha was just the soundscapes, the views, the it's it's a gorgeous expansion. So the team really knocked it out of the park with uh, with a lot of the zones and the feels and creatures. So it's it's worth exploring. Yeah, no, for sure. As, as much as we talk about, hey, you know, a little mid maxi or what are tips and tricks or that kind of thing, being in a rush isn't something you need to be. There's no There's no reason to rush, so... It all depends on how you want to play the game, but yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. One thing oh, about sure. leveling, I just want to, I just want to chime in. Cause I was kind of surprised that, you know, I thought when we saw Shadowlands and we saw kind of um, the chromie time kind of thing come in, we saw the level cap squish and everything like that. I kind of figured that was going to happen every expansion. Uh, so I was a little surprised to see that we were just going to stick at 70 and level to 70, uh, stick at 60 and level to 70. And then, uh, you know, uh, Shadowlands would be, rolled in later but then everything in chromie time would go to 60. um I'm, I'm just wondering like if if that's the model are we just set up for another you know level cap reset in you know a few more expansions here you know i guess it would probably end up being like 10 or 12 years away but i i felt like when they introduced that 
in with Shadowlands, I was like, okay, well, this is going to be the new model, and so this isn't going to be a, a concern every so often. But um, I I would think that we'll probably, you know, we'll be on that road again at some point in the future if we get ten levels per expansion or whatever. We'll have to do a big reset someday. Uh, um, yeah, that's okay with me though. I, don't, I, I kind of prefer. I was thinking the same thing, right? It's just that every expansion from now on is just going to be level sixty to seventy reset, level sixty reset, level sixty, but. I think it's okay to let it go a bit. I don't know. It would feel kind of ba- bad in a way. Like every two years, it's just, I don't know. It, it's yeah. it's something small, but it's nice to grow, you know, in that way. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm personally better with a reset of every three, four, five expansions rather than like back to 60, back to 60, 11.0, back to 60, 12.0, right. back to 60, you know? It would be kind of jarring <laughs> to do it every two years. Yeah. I wonder if they'll keep it lower this time. Like maybe mm-hmm. we cap out at 90 or 100 and then reset instead of going to 120. Um, I know that you know they want to keep the numbers lower to be less intimidating to newer players, returning players, whatever, because you just see a lot of numbers, and without any context, it seems like it's a bigger ask than it might actually be. So it makes sense to do the reset uh, every so often. But uh, I'm a little yeah. curious as well, um, just like on your point, I'm a little curious as well if they're going to do five levels at a time again. You know, some expansions they did that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, th- I think they did that in, in in large part to try to curtail like item level inflation and Mm. and also like i think when it came to cataclysm especially they just didn't want to have to put in 10 new talent points per class and everything like that and then they sort of set that with miss even though miss had the big talent rework it was like okay we're just doing five i yeah i'm really curious to see i mean well you know how is this how is getting like going maybe 70 to 80 next time we're getting a little off track here but like how does that interact with the new talent system are we going to get you know, I don't know, five, six new talents per class or, or something, you know, and it, we'll get additional talent points. You know, how do they, if, if we're going to have additional levels tacked on and expansions and new talent points, then how, how do they not end up in those same pitfalls that they did that prompted a lot of these changes in the past? Oh, I mean, you can always branch the trio farther down as well. I mean, they add, add another row, right? Because they have this, mm-hmm. the sections broken up already. There's a lot of options they have for that, but it will be interesting to see how they choose to handle that down the line. But let's remain focused on current as far as Dragonflight goes. Uh, I wanted, we, we mentioned the zone, so I want to mention some of the dungeons. Uh, so you probably spent the most time in these uh, out of the three of us with testing out Mythic Plus and streaming and, and hopping into these things. Is there one or a few of them that sort of stand out for you as a really fun experience or a neat experience that you've enjoyed? Now, are we talking about the eight season one dungeons or yes. the eight dragon flight dungeons the eight season one dungeons let's we'll, we'll stick with i mean yes of course there's some of them that are not um mm-hmm. current to dragon flight but just in general like looking at looking at season one mythic plus like is there something that's you're pumped for um i mean you know little little trip down nostalgia lane is always nice in some areas so you know it was cool to see temples of the jade serpent and mm-hmm. kind of how they revamped that it was cool to see shadow moon burial grounds especially shadow moon burial grounds right because uh well both of those dungeons you know that was a time before on plus right that was that was all about yeah. uh challenge modes and all that so there's only so much i mean you can really tell you know the mob difficulty the mob density etc in shadow and burial grounds versus one of the new Dragonflight dungeons uh, it just wasn't created for this kind of stuff so despite what they kind of tried to do with members and you know there's going to be some tough areas don't get me wrong but you could just really tell the mechanics were so different on all the bosses and everything um what am I look uh, as far as nostalgia goes? Holes of Valor, Court of Stars. Eh, we can <laughs> <laughs> we can let those ones go for another expansion or two before I miss them, especially Court of Stars. But uh, you know, they all look for me. It's I need to spend more time to finally be like, I don't like this dungeon. I right. like this dungeon because there's a lot of the honeymoon effect right now, right? The wow factor. Hey, it's cool and shiny and new and great. Um, so I'm excited for it. Um, there's definitely been, you know, a lot of alpha beta style missteps in them and some mobs one shotting you and things that just aren't fair for melee and tanks and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I think they're fixed up and ready to go for live. Uh, aesthetically, though, if I had to choose, I'll stick to the four new ones, though, because, you know, we've done the old ones and they were fun and nostalgia and all that. I would say uh, probably as vaults is my favorite one aesthetically including. I can already any M plusers that are listening to this are going to go, oh, God, this guy's crazy because. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff, you know, mechanically in there that people don't like for keys and stuff, but right. it, it just I just got fun vibes from it, right? It's yeah. like um it's like Nexus meets uh Barrett and Hold for me kind of thing. And it was just cool vibes in there. Uh, so I think in terms of just 
ooh and ah wow factor. That's probably the one I'm looking most forward to right now. Yeah, I, I agree with you that it's probably a little bit early to try and come up with what's going to be one of your favorite Mythic Plus dungeons simply because you just haven't done it enough times, seen enough Apexes, done enough you know reps to be able to really get that that groove down of what you like. But I, I appreciate the aesthetic uh, commentary because, yeah, it's, it's something that I know a lot of people are going to be sort of hopping into even not inside a Mythic Plus sense and sort of, you know, checking it out. I know my raid team's already put up a Mythic Zero sign-up sheet for who's going to just grind Mythic Zeros together at some point um, <laughs> before uh, we actually hit the, the first season kicking off. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what everyone thinks about it. Jason, did you have an opinion on the new dungeon stuff at all? Yeah, well, I did a few of uh, a few of the new ones on beta. I think I did um, Ruby Life Pools and uh, Azure Vault and Algathar Academy and I mean the the level design is just so striking. Like it's it's hard to describe. Like if you haven't actually played beta or anything, if you haven't seen these spaces, the level design and the visual fidelity is just it's a leap from Shadowlands. I feel like the spaces are just beautiful. You just want to look at them. You just want to hang out in them and and just observe them. Um, the dungeons are are super nice and yeah, Azure Vault has a has a really cool kind of vibe. It, it's similar to kind of some dungeons we've seen before. You know in overall like layout but you're kind of like descending down this this sort of uh you know narrower space in some of the other dungeons we've seen but then you have like algathar academy which is super wide open and and mostly outdoors and um ruby life pools uses some it makes some really nice use of like indoor and outdoor spaces to prevent to present different kinds of encounters um i feel like dungeons have been such a highlight of this game for many years now i mean i would say you know I, i guess pretty much forever but you think about sort of this recent era of the game the last like 10 years or so there have been so many good ones um and you know now that they have a a method of keeping dungeons relevant throughout the life of an expansion making them replayable and scalable um you're really starting to see the overall dungeon design like grow up alongside that system and the way people interact with it and um I, i think the big thing that encourages me about these dungeons is the tuning that we saw throughout like Shadowlands, they didn't let dungeons just be in the state that like see the triumvirate was at the end of Legion or something. Like they want you to do the dungeons and they want they want the dungeons to, you know, maybe there's there's texture of difficulty within the dungeon pool, but they don't want just straight up like dead keys. Um, I think as long as they as long as they tune them to the point where they feel fun for the vast majority of players, then I, I think we're in good shape. I mean the you know, the I and I know it's controversial to have uh, we're not going to have all eight dungeons in the first Mythic Plus pool season. And um, then we're going to rotate these older ones in and then we'll rotate everything out and have, have a totally fresh pool. Um, it doesn't really bother me that much like from a design perspective. I think there are there's a lot of good content they can tap and, and reuse and make relevant to players. I'm not... Um, yeah, I'm definitely not sad to see like Temple of the Jade Serpent get a crack as a Mythic Plus dungeon. That seems really fun. Um but I think it'll help keep everything fresh as we move through the expansion. I really saw the value of that in season four. I played season four a lot. Um, I played it as much as I played any other season, if not more. And having the big dungeon pool refresh was a big part of why it felt like something fun to do and something I wanted to hop into and check out more of, you know, week to week. So I think, you know, it. I, I would imagine it takes a long time to make a dungeon from the ground up, from like concepting it out to having something you can actually play through. Um you know, patch dungeons must be really hard to make and, and to plan out. But now you have, you know, six years. You have three expansions worth of Keystone dungeons now, plus you can kind of retrofit it onto older dungeons with, you know, varying success, but you can always tune them different, right? Um, I think it's I, I think it's smart. I, I don't, I, on, on its face, I don't have any problem with it. You know, we'll see once we're four months into season one of Dragonflight how I'm feeling about the dungeon pool, but... Um, I, I think initially, though, it might be a little jarring because you want to see the new stuff and you want to check it out. You want to kind of get it under your belt and you want to see, like, what these spaces look like. And you're only going to see, you know, four of them uh, for, for an entire season. So, well, from um, a Mythic Plus perspective, yeah, it's, it's yeah, you yeah. Know, I, I, I agree with you entirely. that I love the fact that they're doing a refresh on bringing back old content to make it actually totally viable again to do. Um, and I also agree that it probably takes a ton of time to actually concept out bosses and the flow of a dungeon, the route, what it's going to look like, conceptualize the story, because typically there's story associated with it. So being able to reuse those assets is uh, a huge benefit to the game. Uh, we've talked about many times about time walking and, and that aspect being something that we want 
to see them doing more of to make it more uh, more accessible for players to actually see some of these older you know raids and older dungeons that are uh, actually quite fun to do. Uh, I want to shift a little bit um, away from dungeons and towards raids because raids are something that uh, obviously you know we have Salute here on the show who's going to be taking it quite seriously uh, in the whole race to world first stuff that goes on. Um, but also, you know, obviously Jason from the heroic perspective and then me, I guess from like a more like random, sometimes mythic, sometimes heroic perspective for this first season, uh, which will be interesting to do. Um, but, uh, salute as far as, uh, raid testing goes leading into this, uh, it, I've heard good things about a lot of the, the raid content. Have you enjoyed what you've seen so far? Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely enjoyable. Uh, again, you know, I probably return here at least from one positive thing um, that the dungeons share as well. It's just, you know, honeymoon phase, yeah. shiny, yeah. new, fun. It's always fun to see new encounters. Uh, you know, it looks cool. We're definitely back to, even from a lore perspective, you know, back to the basics now with this expansion and, and that extends to raiding as well. So there's not some, you know, crazy maniacal bald demigod with a massive mace trying to destroy the universe. There's just, mm -hmm. you know, some evil dragons and, and we got to put them down. Um, so, you know, it looks exciting, looks fun. Uh, I think from the competitive perspective, I don't really know if it's a worry or a concern uh, that people or we have or whatever. Um, definitely an observation that it looks like it's going to be a pretty easy tier. Um, I don't know if to the level of Emerald Nightmare style, right? I mean, that was just a complete blunder. Um, but, y you know, especially, I mean, all signs are pointing to it. Uh, the tuning and testing, which traditionally for some bosses is very hard. I mean guilds barely reach some of the mythic testing, you know, later phases and, and things are crazy and all that. I mean, everybody was basically killing mythic bosses left and right, you know, holding off on DPS just to try and test mechanics, which is a little weird in itself. And, you know, Ian in several interviews saying, um, you know, we want to make these more accessible for normal and heroic. I'm curious to see what Jason says about that. I uh, want to make these a little more accessible. You know, we'll never do anything as hard as Sepulchre. It's the first rate of the expansion. Uh, we're, you know, it's before the holidays. Uh, we're releasing all the difficulties together. So everything kind of points to the fact that this, you know, the, the, the actual time spent in Mythic raiding and progressing for the Race of World First guilds will probably only total like four to six days, right? Um, so they won't be killed, I don't think. I don't think we'll have a world first in the first week. Maybe. Maybe it's a six or seven day thing. I don't think. I think it'll be, um, you know, day eight or nine, like very fresh into the reset because there will inevitably be a few days spent gearing, right? Because everything's launching at the same time. So people yeah. are going to be grinding M plus and grinding, you know, heroic splits and normal splits and all that before even setting foot to Mythic. But the actual time of Mythic start, you know, boss one to Razigev the Dying for Mythic, I don't, you know, I can't. I can't possibly see taking anything crazy. What's your window for, you know, what your your personal, and make that clear, window for what, how long you like a raid tier to be for you, Mythic rating? Um, I think it should be, and this is, you know, assuming that we'll ever return back to Heroic Week and then Mythic Week following. Right. Um, I personally like to see a Mythic raid cleared somewhere between, you know, roughly day 10 to 13. So midway through reset two, but definitely not into reset three. You know, if it's like it's like particularly harder, let's say, you know, getting close to that second reset kind of thing, but not not pushing that. Anything lower, I think, is just too fast and it's a little dissatisfying. And then you get the whole NA versus EU start time thing and blah, blah, blah. And anything that's longer is just it just I mean, we, just, we saw Sepulchre, right? Like it's yeah. just it, it really drags on and people got to go back to work. And I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this is not a massive blizzard official event and you know people are paid for it i mean there's people that are paid because of the orgs they might raid in but yeah. you know you can't just take a month off to raid sepulcher and, and be dandy about it so for me it's always been that that 10 to 13 day mark uh, I, I think that's the sweet spot um over the many 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 years i've been doing this well it's it's it's, it's a personal you know preference when it comes to that sort of thing because there are people who like much faster content clears people who like know much longer drawn out time it's it, it is about time commitment to a certain level you're talking about teams that do that 10 to 16 hour a day you know at least raid window for some of these teams mm -hmm. um where you know other teams might do 10 hours a week or six hours a week and so there's there's kind of a variance in in how long that content gets stretched out but i i agree that i'm happy that um it's looking like it's going to be a bit of an easier tier i think it's needed for a lot of the teams to sort of have a chance to in a lot of ways, maybe not, not not at your level, but 
uh, maybe in the, the top 100 kind of level, um, start to form up again and, and merge with all the new players that have come in. Part of the, the side effect of uh, having so many back-to-back -back difficult raid tiers in Shadowlands is a lot of teams broke up and people spread out and recruited in. And there's, you know, in a lot of cases, you see teams with four or five applicants or six applicants at the same time who are going to try and find their vibe with a new team in a new dungeon, sorry, in, in a new raid with new talents, with a new class, with, you know, and I, I think it's nice to have that starting raid be something that is more accepting to allowing people time to, to work on all the other things outside of the mechanics and how difficult the mechanics are for raids. So um, I, I think, yeah, if they hit that mark of the seven to eight day for, you know, the teams that are pushing that hard, um, and are, are uh, skilled enough to, to do it in, in that seven to eight days this time around, I'd, I'd actually be kind of happy seeing that window uh, be what we see, uh, because it means that for the teams that are, you know, like the one that I'm currently on, it's probably a, you know, six to eight week kind of range tops to try and clear something like this, maybe four to six weeks to try and clear something like this, which I think is a good window for um, a lot of, of those top 100 or top 50 raid teams to sort of clear through stuff. So that'll be good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I um, you know, anything. I think if it gets cleared in the first week, for me, it's disappointing. And you know, this starts to bleed. And we, I mean, you guys can do fifteen shows on this, but yeah. this starts to bleed into the whole like, you know, one percenter crew, no life in crew versus just your your average WoW player, whether yeah. they be you know a little more hardcore on the mythic side or heroic. And it's it's a it's it's a tricky balance, right? Because everybody wants their piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think where Blizzard really needs to nail it is, frankly, gear progression, right? Uh, and they said it themselves, uh, player power progression. You know, you don't want to keep going into Sepulchre style where every week they need to constantly nerf it for the guilds that are, you know, taking it a little more casual um, just to make it hard enough for, you know, all the top five, top ten, whatever guilds that are going, um, you know, to clear it in 13 days, 10 days. Um, so I think a lot of those natural nerfs need to happen with, you know, your guild, Spencer, throughout the weeks getting that player power that is just terribly inaccessible to guilds that are just no lifing at the beginning yeah no yeah no i i think there there could be a lot done with um looking at the the player power progression over time and allowing for teams that want to have that four to six or six to eight week clear to be able to accomplish it within that time frame, even while making the content early on difficult without going, hey, we're going to hit everything with a giant bat every week to make sure that, you know, that essentially, hey, if, if, you aren't, if you aren't skilled enough for putting in the time early enough on to be able to clear it in the first two weeks, you're going to fight a different version of the boss than the, the other teams fought. That's that's a it, mm -hmm. it it's unfortunate. And I, I mentioned this actually pre-show to, to salute uh, Holandris was just such a classic example of a boss that was like radically different after they finally hit it with the big nerf bat, um, the entire mechanical structure of the fight just felt incredibly different after uh, after they actually put in their nerfs for it. And I, I, I don't like them having to do that. I would rather they increase player power. And of course, obviously, some of the, the forgiveness of uh, some of the mechanics to a certain degree, not to the degree they went to, to be able to allow that to, to function for players and players be able to get through it. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of lessons that they pulled out of Sepulchre, and I'm, I'll be excited to see what... Uh, what some of the mechanics are for this raid um jason heroic side what mm -hmm. are you guys what are you guys feeling well you know it feels good to hear uh Slute say that stuff because that's sort of what my expectations are kind of like with relatively low information right i'm going by stuff that ian has has said uh publicly and you know some things about the way they're releasing this raid and the timing um i haven't really looked at the fights yet or anything i usually wait until you know the week before we're going to start actually looking at them to to do any research um, I will say this, I mean, I've said it on the show many times over the last two years, year and a half, you know, rating has just gotten, it, it's gotten a, just too hard and too top heavy at, at the top end. You know, this was a, a tough expansion for my team. I had a bunch of people who just really couldn't cut it anymore, you know, and we didn't get, you know, usually we'll have like that little mythic cup of coffee, maybe do like three, four bosses or whatever in a mythic raid. I don't think we got more than three bosses in, in any raid. And that was in Nathria, which was like by far the easiest raid to begin with, um, which is disappointing, you know, because we raid every week and I want to I want people to feel encouraged to log on and check out the game and, you know, check out a new boss. Let's always have like a boss on the menu to try to, you know, uh, progress on. And we didn't get to do a lot of that, this expansion. Um, the final bosses were kind of 
all brutally hard and or frustrating. Like they 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 both scored pretty high on like a, a frustration axis, you know, in addition to being difficult. You know, Denathrius, you had the problems with having to hold DPS or like time DPS very specifically, uh, especially at certain parts of like gear progression. Um, and it was just a very frust. It could be a very frustrating exercise from week to week to like get the the mix that you needed to get the timing that you wanted down to progress the fight. Um, Sylvanas is pretty much my least favorite final boss ever made. Um, it, the whole thing just feels like a, a prelude to phase three, and it's so long and drawn out. Uh, feels non interactive in a lot of ways because you're just you're chipping away at this massive health pool that you'll never kill, and you're fighting a bunch of ads and. Um, but it's also kind of like mechanically overloaded. Jailer was actually not as bad compared to the other final bosses from a heroic perspective, but you also had Sepulcher in general, which, you know, um, Anduin and Lords of Dread were incredibly punishing fights to try to get a, a more casual team to learn. Uh, the, both of those fights had so much personal responsibility and so much potential for one player to wipe the group that you know, you get frustrated and you're trying to do kind of a more relaxed team, a couple hours a week, you know, get AOTC and, you know, a couple months maybe, and then just enjoy farming. And it's like, well, that attitude just didn't fly, especially by the time Sepulcher came around. The fights were too complex and too punishing. If people made simple mistakes, it's like, well, now not only are you dead, you also killed our best DPS. And, you know, stuff like that snowballs in a fight really quick. Um, I would like to see him walk it back overall a little bit. You know, I, you want to have fights that are like epic and cool and have these, these big moments and, and tell their own story, like within the encounter kind of, and I get that. Um, but I think they, they have just kind of tended to go more and more overboard with like mechanic density and how punishing mechanics are in these fights to the point where, you, you kind of have a, a hard time finding the fun. Like, what is the fun of doing this encounter? This is, this, this just starts to turn into like an organizational headache. You have people who maybe like, you know, they can't handle this kind of mechanic. Like, do we even have to bring them? Can I send them for this or whatever? Because they just can't, they can't understand their job. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, Sepulcher kind of pushed that to an extreme that they're not going to reach anytime soon. And now it's all about walking it back and, and just having, having raid content that, is fun first and then adds these other layers on, you know, I, in, instead of starting from like, all right, what are the craziest, what's the craziest combo of mechanics we could throw at the wall to really push like the high end teams. And then how can we sort of, you know, uh, distill that down for lower difficulties? Like, I don't, that's what it feels like. That's what it, how it feels like some of the stuff has been designed over the last few years. And I don't think it's working anymore. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we've been we've been led to expect um, less of that in this expansion, and at least certainly in in this first season of this expansion. So, I'm looking forward to it, man. I I, I mean, raiding is a thing that I sort of started to dread at, at certain portions of of Shadowlands, and that's I mean, raiding's my favorite thing to do in the game, and I raid with a pretty big crew of cool people that I like playing with, and I like having fun with them, and I clashed with you know, certain people in my guild and I had to like remove people from the raid team. And, you know, I had like, even among leadership, like we had issues because we kind of disagreed with the direction and what the goals really were. Um, and I've been with these people for like 11 years, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> we've been doing this a long time uh, together and we've seen a lot of different eras of the game and a lot of different bosses. And this was the one that almost just cracked it in half. You know, it was almost done in in early on in sepulcher to be honest with you um and i mean there's a lot of reasons for that obviously people get older priorities change different stuff happens shadowlands was not the best expansion overall and, and a lot of people were showing up just out of obligation as it was but you know the raids even in even in the darkest days of you know warlord 6.2 or whatever like the raid content and and the fun of like that co-op experience of doing the big raids that's kind of the glue that always held it together and you know, once the crack started showing in that in Shadowlands, it was like, dude, I, I mean, where do we go from here? And so I hope that, I, I, I mean, Ian going on like Cowley stream or wherever that interview was and saying, yeah, we've been in an arms race with the, the, you know, the world first guild. It's like, thank you for acknowledging this publicly. Like we need to walk this back for, you know, the, the broad rating player base. I feel like. Yeah. I think 
This is always a really interesting topic because, you know, listening to what you're saying, I don't disagree with anything you're saying from your perspective, right? Um, but on the flip side, you know, I don't want them to, at least for me, water down all the encounters and make them super easy. So how do you serve the entire player base? And I think one thing that they're or at least haven't done well, Shadowlands especially, and I'm glad you mentioned a lot of those examples, was they didn't really properly separate the difficulties, in my opinion, right? Like, you shouldn't have the same craziness of Anduin on Heroic and to a certain extent normal. Um, you know, there's four difficulties for a reason in this game. If if they want to put some insane stuff for Mythic crazy guilds, then, you know, put it in Mythic, especially in the last half of the raid. You know, make the first half of the raid somewhat accessible for guilds trying to push themselves. But I, I think especially for normal and Heroic, like, they just went to too nutty and that's why i mentioned earlier it's it's something that they want to pull back on now and i think it's for that reason right they want that accessibility for people to go and raid and have fun and not worry in normal mode that one guy's gonna wipe the raid on on anduin or something yeah I, i've definitely felt those i mean and i've had conversations with people on my raid team about that and i've as feedback i've heard from people that i play with and people that we talk to you know via the channels for the show like yeah, like sometimes it, heroic does feel too mechanics dense or too mechanically similar to mythic, maybe, you know, and and then mythic becomes, uh, you know, the biggest difference is kind of the throughput check. But mechanically, it's like for heroic or even for normal, yeah, some of the, some of those mechanics that they that they landed on when like sepulcher came out were incredibly punishing for more casual teams. So, um, I mean, what you said I think is is spot on. Like, there's four different difficulties for a reason and. I know it's hard to take like a fight conceptually and then kind of dial in exactly where each fight needs to be for each difficulty. But I do think that was maybe, maybe one of the most glaring problems with, I, I think overall the raids were really good in this expansion, but the, in Shadowlands, like the pain points, the stuff that I remember and I'm going to walk away with is, you know, the Denathrius wipes and, and 13 minute Sylvanas kills and, the Anduin frustration. Like, I'm not going to remember the the fights that were fun and that we had a good time on, pain, right? I'm going to remember pain the bringer. frustration. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, Painsmith, uh, you know, pain, pain and, um, and Fate Scribe, like, these, these uh, even Lords of Dread to a lesser extent, you know, the, they, they've done, they, they kind of swung for the fences with some of the design, and I like that, but when the game's not giving you the proper amount of information or the tuning feels off for your difficulty it's just discouraging, you know, and I don't, I, I think when we're, you know, you're looking at a, a team like ours where like the core pieces, the core of the team has been playing together for, you know, a, again, a decade plus six expansions or whatever at this point, five, five expansions, six expansions, just used to that AOTC level in relatively short amount of time, every, every time out. And then it's like, you get to this one and you get some brain drain and, and the overall game was kind of impacting people's enthusiasm. Then you include these really dense and difficult fights and just turn people off. So I'm hoping that, I mean, from what I've seen from Dragonflight so far, I, I feel like it's going to be a 180 from that experience. And I, I hope it ends up being more in that category because I feel like we need it, you know, just as the player base in general, we need some good vibes and we need, we need to have fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, moving on from raids. Thanks for that great chat. That was perfect. Uh, as far as professions go, uh, so is there a particular path that you're feeling you have to do? Are you sort of covering all the bases to, across all tunes? Like, what's the, what's your your feeling on the profession system for this time around? Uh, well, okay. So from a competitive perspective, yeah. I have people making gear for me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. This the is the best thing. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, definitely don't want to derail WoW here, right? But oh, no. some of the concepts of Final Fantasy fourteen certainly bled into um, the professions and the crafting revamp in WoW mm -hmm. uh, in a positive way, in my opinion. You know, with, of course, with their own twist on it. Um, so it did open up a lot of that. What I think, I mean, I don't think anyone here is going to disagree that professions have needed a, a bit of love for a long time a long in this time. game, yeah. a long time. So, um, you know, this is it and they'll build on it and I'm really excited for it. Um, like I said, you know, from a competitive perspective, whatever, well, you know, jokes aside, will I be doing my own stuff? Yeah, of course, you know, especially gathering, there's, you know, BOP items that you have to get for work orders, et cetera, and, um, or crafting orders and, you know, help the people making your stuff, make your stuff. Um, not to mention the gold that goes into it. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that this encourages kind of, you know, the what kind of used to be old school thing of really 
you know, if you want to spend a long time crafting in this game and making your a name for yourself as the blacksmith or uh, making a good, you know, amount of gold off of it and whatever, it's something you can really pour time into and specialize and and get some good stuff out of. So I'm glad to see that kind of niche coming back, hopefully, in WoW and that they're pushing for it. Um, outside of that, I am I'm somebody that loves something that's been lost to me, at least for a long time in WoW. And it made me think about it again when when Jason was talking about uh, um, dragon riding as well is just like stuff to do, right? Like mm -hmm. stuff to do in this game. It's something that I feel, you know, I've just like you guys, I've been playing this for 18 years and Shadowlands was by far the least interaction I've had with World of Warcraft yeah. in a long time. Yeah. I mean, I felt zero reason to log into the game. I was, I was raid logging for months. Um, just, you know, maybe that's a bit of me, you know, life and new games coming out and I'm a streamer and stuff like that. Um, but I just didn't feel that passion that I used to to go do stuff because they just haven't added a lot of stuff. You know, there's nothing really to do in Shadowlands. I felt like that intrigued me. So this concept of, you know, collecting appearances for your dragons or or to the point here with crafting, just, you know, leveling your crafting, going out and finding rare mats and and just, you know, the 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 rarity of one, two, three star things like that is stuff that's very appealing to me because. I think that it's important in games like WoW and WoW especially to have things that can distinguish and reward players for not necessarily just skill. This isn't about mythic players, but their time investment too, right? Their yeah. passion for the game. Um, and I, to me, that's something that the game has been severely missing for a while. And I hope uh, Dragonflight starts to you know curtail and build upon that. And crafting is definitely one of those things for me uh, that you know. When I'm done with my progression, when I'm done with Race to World first stuff, I, I'm definitely going to be pouring a lot of time into, you know, grinding that kind of stuff and going out and getting those mats and being excited to see a, you know, a, an ore vein somewhere and going to mine it and be like, yeah, tier three, you know, things like that. So definitely, definitely a, a good direction, I think, overall. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm really, you touched on here that I'm really excited about, because um, you talked about, oh, other people will be making my gear for me, is that in a sense they've they've made it possible for you to have two gathering professions as your primary professions and not feel like you're missing out on crucial critical things that you need to be able to craft on your own you can be the supplier to the artisans who then make you things that you then put on your character that are amazing like you don't have to be that person who is going out there and has leatherworking and has uh enchanting because they have to have the best thing for the rings and they have to have the best armor patch or whatever it is uh, that they're going to be able to put together. You can actually have other people craft those things for you and be the supplier who's able to actually um, give them the materials and, and supply the market, which I, I just, I love that that is something that they've moved towards because it's such a freedom for players who enjoy the zen of gathering. I really enjoy gathering. I, I, I do too. Um, to that point, I do want to say one thing though, because you just reminded me of it. Okay. Um, I think the one miss for me um most of the people I've talked to will agree. There's definitely some that don't. So if you guys don't agree, I'm curious to hear why. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very big miss for me. The only thing with crafting that they uh, still didn't allow you to be a multi crafter, um, whether that be step one, where you still choose two crafting professions and you have all of your secondary professions available to you, yeah. or you're just able to do literally all of them. Um, to me, it was a big missed opportunity. I can understand maybe the lack of appeal for being able to do absolutely everything like leatherworking and blacksmithing and enchanting yeah. but i do think you should be able to choose two crafting professions while still being able to you know put a mining pick into a rock um yeah. and, and pick up an herb and stuff so to me that was a missed opportunity and i don't know maybe it's something we'll consider in the future but i would i would love to see a development of the system and along the same lines that you're talking about um where it, it almost is a talent tree of you have a certain amount of points you can spend to be able to choose how deep into different professions you want to go so you can be someone who can make you know more basic things like armor patches and whatnot for leatherworking but you can then dive deeper into blacksmithing because you want to be able to make really amazing weapons like blacksmithing and you have to sort of choose the balance of how many points you spend in which profession to decide how deep you want to go how much you want to unlock in that tree and then as you you know made the point of have access to every gathering everyone should be able to gather everything there should just be ways to make it more efficient so if you choose to then spend some of the points that you're spending into your other professions to sort of advance them into gathering, you can then gather more resources, you gather them faster, you can be more efficient when you're doing it. Like th those sorts of things to me would be neat to see. Like there's th this to me is a, the first step, right? If they're able mm -hmm. to then take this and dive deeper into, hey, you know what? We want there to be a system for professions if people want to do it. 
uh, where they could just choose to go full into gathering all the way. Everything they gather, they gain more of. Or they could be someone who can pick flowers, but they're really good at finding those gems inside those nodes of ore, right? Like that kind mm -hmm. of idea would be kind of neat to see uh, them them sort of advance towards. As far as you talked about with with all the other crafting professions, I I, I think it would be fine to have someone have uh, enough sort of points, if you will, to spend to become a master in, in two different things, but then at least have a little bit of knowledge about something else. I think would be kind of neat to see. So mm -hmm. they can choose to be sort of a jack of all trades to a certain degree where you're not able to make the, the best of the best stuff, but you can kind of make all the basics across the board if that's something you want to do. So yeah, I, I hope this is the first step. I think it'd be really exciting to see them go farther with it. Yeah, I think bringing in the, the granularity with the system and the concept of quality, maybe that could be, you know, maybe that could be a thing where they feel um, comfortable shifting into that to have like multi-gatherers or whatever and a crafting profession. I could kind of see the logic of like, we want to keep the professions restricted the way that they traditionally have been because, you know, obviously some char some players are going to have characters to cover all their bases, right? And be self-sufficient. But your average player is going to pick whatever appeals to them, whatever speaks to them for their character for whatever reason. And they're probably just going to play that. And then everybody making those choices means everybody has a niche, which means everybody can potentially cooperate, collaborate, you know, you have a you have a way to market your skills, especially with crafting orders coming in and everything. So, I think it's okay. Uh, you know, a, a thing that we have talked about on the show a lot is that, you know, compared to the other games of its day and sort of the way that a lot of uh, MMO type games, not necessarily MMO RPGs specifically, but just MMOs like overall, more survival survival type games and stuff like. Crafting has really been de-emphasized in in WoW compared yeah. to a lot of other games. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and, and sort of the games that WoW was like a, a, an alternative to and, and kind of usurped, crafting was a bigger part of the end game experience. And it was more, you know, the, the play wasn't as directed, the content wasn't as kind of curated as, as we're used to in, in modern WoW. So it was like, well, go out in the world and pick stuff up and then learn how to make good items out of it, you know? And that was sort of point of, of end game in a lot of ways. Um, so I think WoW kind of rejected that on purpose because they wanted to introduce more of the directed experience. But also I think it, it has been a missed opportunity many times over the years. You know, I, what I really like about this is kind of like to kind of allude to what Slew was saying, like the fact that this is sort of like intrinsic to your character, you know, the system is hopefully built to last and built to grow and it feels really like part of your character's identity. You know, it's, it's very robust compared to what we've had for professions in the past. And it's like, that third or maybe fourth pillar alongside your character's like race, class, spec, profession. You know, it, it could be that way with with sort of how broad and deep the system is, which I think would be a, a great addition to the game because you can easily see this carrying forward into the expansion after this and the one after that and the one after that, right? It's, it's just this framework you can build off of. You can theme around, you know, the new expansion coming in, offer new recipes, offer new materials, and then you have to master gathering them and and turning them into finished uh items like it's all right there and it feels very rpg i mean even like uh to the economy point uh, you know like um like you are you're participating in in this bigger system it's not like it's not even like a raid it's like your whole server economy maybe even your whole region economy if you're talking about consumables and crafting mats like um there's something about that that although separated from combat, like that's fundamental to many types of like RPG video games, you know? So I haven't had a chance to mess with this. Like I didn't do profession stuff on beta. I, I figured like it, it, stuff was moving around pretty fast and stuff was changing and they were testing certain professions at some times and then not at others and certain features weren't available. And like, I don't have infinite time to play. I don't even have as much time to play as I maybe would really like to. So I'm not going to spend the time that I do have to play like gathering on beta and testing professions out. Um, uh, it just wasn't one of the things I touched in the time I spent. So I don't really have a good handle on like what I'm going to do with this necessarily. But I mean, you look at the official communication that they've put out for the changes to the system, everything that's coming in with, um, you know, that your profession gear uh, being able to craft really high level pieces, being able to recraft pieces to reset the secondaries on them. Um, I mean, all, all of these elements, like you're going to have so much granularity and ways to customize how you play and how you approach crafting. Uh, I think it's going to be great for people that want to engage with it. And it's kind of like, 
the activity that you do, right? Instead of grinding AP or grinding anima or what have you that was sort of like laid out on a table for you in, in recent expansions. This is a lot more open-ended. And I guess the other cool thing is, dude, if you don't want to do any of this stuff, like you really don't have to. You you can you can just spend coin and just have people buy stuff for you if if that's how you play the game. And you're not going to necessarily like miss out on anything. But if you're really into the collection aspect, if you're into, you know, uh, making gold from professions, if you're into watching the bar fill up and skilling up and making cool stuff, then I, th I think it's going to offer a lot of, it's going to offer a lot to people that want to engage with it. But if you're like, dude, I'm not doing this. I just want to do dungeons or whatever. It, this isn't like Torghast where it's like, well, your character just sucks now because you didn't, you know, play in this feature. If, if you got gold, then you can at least take advantage of other people interacting with the system. Yeah. Well, I'd be I will say, uh, I just want to add one no, more no, thing no. to that. I, I will say the one thing that I'm a little worried about, and this is, this is probably, this comes with, you know, jaded old man plays Warcraft for 18 years and yells at cloud kind of thing. I'm, I'm always thinking about what's next. Right. So to me, this is going to be fun. To, there's nothing more special than a wow launch. This crafting looks great. But what happens with crafting in six months, in 12 months, right? Because a lot of the content that comes with this is super front loaded, right? Like the gates open, all the hamsters, you know, bottleneck through and, and we're all we're all grinding away at blacksmithing and whatever. But you will eventually fill up all the specialization trees. It'll take you, you know, mileage will vary depending how much you play the game, but you, you will finish it at some point. What are they going to do? Add a new specialization tree every major patch? I mean, they'll, they'll add the basics, right? They'll add, you know, the next tier of patterns and, and you know, maybe uh, an extra material that comes from the raid and, and season two dungeons, whatever it may be. But like the really massive chunk of this overhaul, players will get through eventually. So I'm, I'm kind of curious and maybe a little worried. How are they going to, you know, sustain this crafting fantasy and this crafting allure? going forward in the future you know that's like a future me problem i guess but it is something i think right. about a lot yeah i mean like the, the system is built to be scaled up but you're right like it, at some point i mean they could add like a new mat or a new slate of mats per mm -hmm. gathering or crafting like when a you know you add a patch you add a new zone maybe you know we've seen that many times but like that yeah that's not the kind of like ongoing sort of loop and and content that you're kind of creating there so i mean i, I think you know, maybe they're okay with like, all right, well, your gathering's like maxed out for this expansion, so good job. Now benefit from it to the best of your ability yeah. and your server's economy. Um, I, you know, I, I think also I play on a low pop server, right? My server has emptied out. I my my guild at two of ten mythic was not even remotely challenged for number one on the realm. <laughs> like we, I don't have any raid any mythic raid teams on my realm, um, so there aren't markets for a lot of items that you can craft and auction right um the region-wide auction house was a huge boon i mean we were thinking of server transferring um this this summer in in lieu of any other changes because the basically because the economy was unfunctional right like recruiting is tricky on a low pop server but if you have a good consistent team like people who are fits will want to play with you um I don't really like asking people to spend money to come to a dead realm, but that, that's, you know, that's between me and them and, and whatever. But, you know, when you couldn't buy flasks because there weren't any, or cause they were a thousand gold a piece and you couldn't afford, you know, your, your reagents and consumables for the, for the week, like that was a big problem. So the, the region wide auction house has been, has been huge for us and having that, and a wide market for stuff that I gather, for example, I think that could be, that could be a reason to continue to gather for me, even if like, okay, my mining is maxed out or whatever. I don't have anything I'm specifically working on. At least I have this huge market that I can, I can dump stuff onto and, and get some benefit back from. So yeah. it's been like opening up a, a brand new universe for us on, on my low pop realm. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's an interesting thing because a lot of people who play, um, at, at the the higher end mythic stuff end up on incredibly high pop pop realms so they might not exactly know what's happening on low pops when it comes to situations like you talked about with there being a scarcity in things and there not being you know enough people around to even make flasks to be able to look at the auction house to get that word or enough augment runes or enough whatever it is to be able to actually afford to do anything uh, just because when you're on these these full or high pop servers 
it's just the market's flooded all of the time and it's always there and there's always access to it. And yes, the prices go up and down, but it's never that the supply doesn't exist is just one of those things. So it's, it's interesting. It's one of those problems you don't think about that much. All right. Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time chatting about evokers since, you know, it's dragon expansion and there's a new class and they're dragons. What's that? <laughs> Does it have a tank spec? If not, can we skip this? <laughs> I, I know you've probably played it a reasonable amount uh, just for, for streaming, you know, purposes. Uh, what, you know, opinions, thoughts, opinions? How do you feel about it? The, you know, different, you mixing it up? Uh, you know, oddly enough, I actually haven't played, well, I haven't played it that much recently, but obviously when it first came out, you know, streaming yeah. alpha, hype, 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 I, I played yeah. it then. So, you know, I've also, uh, of course, I've kept up with their changes for the most part, especially things I need to know is, you know, from a either raid leading perspective or what cooldowns exist for me as a tank. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've kept in touch with all of that. Um, it's it's always difficult to approach these conversations because I'm very mindful that usually when I'm talking to people, there is definitely a subset of hardcore mythic raiders listening as well. And they go, like, oh, this guy's crazy. What was he talking about? <laughs> um, versus the people that are just like, hey, is the, is the class fun? Right? Yeah. Like, is it yeah. cool to push buttons on the yeah. class? Um, it's fun, right? It's, it's fun. It's different. Another class with glide finally, uh, you know, the fantasy of breathing fire and, um, I, I forgot the name of the ability, but, uh, both specs have one where you, you just take in the air and go forward 50 yards and just breathe on everything. You know, you cinder ghost everything essentially under you. So they definitely have some cool fantasy effects and, you know, Blizzard exploring this kind of empowerment channeled casting spells and, there's definitely neat stuff um, and, and some new stuff, just like when Demon Hunters first came out, there was some new stuff, right? Gliding, double jump. But yeah, everybody lost. I remember when Blizzard first announced double jump for DH and everyone just erupted and cheering. And so so there's neat stuff like that about Evoker. Um, I, I will say from a just subjective fantasy perspective, I'm a little miffed that, you know, you get these dragonoid awesome characters but they're all kind of like skinny cassidy like you know there's gotta yeah. be some like you know big boys there i mean we've seen some of the draconids that exist mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. like where's the thickums dudes uh so i guess it kind of plays into makes sense why they didn't launch a tank spec which i i think is a blessing and a curse for me um but i'm a little weirded out right i was i, I really wanted to build like a really just tank thickums kind of dragon guy well, even, um, even like the centaur style shape of a of a dragonoid, where they have the torso, you know, that's a little more humanoid, but then the, the their back end is four legs, kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just uh, you know, like so many ways they could have gone with it. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, art de art department for me always nails and carries, right? I mean, crazy amount of customization options and all this oh, yeah. really, really, really cool stuff. Um, as far as uh, the direct theory go for evokers, um, I just you know, it's just personal. Like I mm -hmm. wish there was. Uh, it could be a, a little thicker. Um, I wish there was a tank spec from like a fun perspective because, uh, but not from a balance perspective because six is enough to handle every expansion, so I'm good. Um, but, you know, because even from the, the fantasy design of each one, right, you have preservation, which is very bronze and green magic, and then you have, um, why am I forgetting the, the name of the, the DPS uh, spec for the evokers? Um, you know, they're, they're centered around blue and red magic, um, but they're still black, right? Black dragon flight. So that would have been, at least from that perspective, a perfect opportunity for the tank spec, right? Tank spec focuses heavily on, on black dragon flight. Devastation. And, uh, devastation. Thank you. Uh, focuses heavily on their, you know, like their magics and whatever. So who knows, you know, people are like, oh, don't worry, salute. Maybe in the future, I'm like, now okay, well, I'm still waiting for that third DH spec. So <laughs> I don't think it's happening anytime soon. Uh, but, but they're a blast. I would definitely recommend making one even just for the fun of it you know their mini version of dragon riding uh they're gliding their their abilities um just just they're they're a good time it's you know you, we don't get new classes very often in wow um even if it ends up not being your cup of tea i think you'd be doing yourself a disservice not to at least just poke around on one and, and see what's going on their starting area is also very cool very fun that quest line and it's a good intro to some of the uh kind of protagonist antagonist situation going on and you know as as the story's developing now in dragon isle so yeah I'd, I'd say get in there yeah the uh their version of dragon riding is something you can use anywhere in azeroth which is kind of neat they uh they did tweak it quite a bit since when it first came out um there was a lot of people doing almost like runs uh where they would start on, on the mm -hmm. wall in pandaria and then try and get as far as they could along the wall as fast as they could and compare with normal flight versus dragon riding flight and 
all the speeds. And yes, there was tuning that happened around that that did ruin some of the fun that existed <laughs> from from that. But it was it was it's neat. It's neat for the, the possibilities that exist with that. So that's that's really the other thing I noticed uh, with evokers coming in and doing some of even Sepulcher was bosses like Zymox, where groups need to travel over to other platforms inside the Mythic difficulty. You can pick up people and fly them over to the other platform as evokers, which is really cool. Um, so there's a lot of utility there that that's just fun with a new class coming in and being able to do that. And the, the options for that are, are great. And there's nothing like someone puckering up because they suddenly got grabbed and taken somewhere they weren't expecting. <laughs> Surprising I, them. I, I, I... I was going to say utility or griefing. <laughs> exactly. Like, just as easily put someone in fire and yep. then glide out. It's a out fine it. line. It's a fine line between utility is. and griefing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I know. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fun class. I like that they brought in the um, press and hold spell to be able to charge it up and have different effects happen because I was telling Jason about this where I feel like once they were able to get the green light to do that with uh evokers uh it we also at the same you know shortly after that got the uh hey you can just press and hold down a key for it to just chain mm -hmm. cast that spell and so i think you know for for mages out there who just like casting frostbolt over and over again you can just hold down the button now as opposed to spamming it on your keyboard which will extend the life of your peripherals which is also nice but um, people's wrists have rejoiced worldwide. exactly yes, joints, yeah. Yeah. not only your keyboards but your, your, your connective tissue yeah. exactly so it's it's something where I, I felt like those were connected in a sense of once they got approval for one they were able to do the other so it's neat to see the the rippling effects of new class design come into a game uh because it's i don't know it's just it's just great to to have something new for people to try out but also to allow the wow team to really flex a little more uh, their their muscles and the variety of things they're doing with characters and classes. So, yeah, I, I mean, to, to that point, it also opens up, uh, you know, wouldn't be surprised if you know, probably next expansion, who knows, maybe even midway through an expansion, you start seeing empowered spells for the classes we already know. Right? Yeah. yeah, and it just it opens up that possibility. Yep. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with what you said about like I'm I'm kind of sad from a fun perspective that there's no evoker uh, tank spec, but from a gameplay and balance perspective, I'm happy like. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't do anything else except play tank specs, really. And I, I don't feel like we need another one. I don't, I don't think there's like really room anyway. I, I don't know what its niche would be. I'm not a game designer, but I can't fathom like what would set it apart. But it would be really cool to make like, yeah, the new Draconids are so cool looking too. And to make one of those and just you know tear around a dungeon tanking stuff would be. It would be the fun factor would be off the charts probably, but. I definitely breathe a little sigh of relief. Like, okay, this is not something I need to even consider really messing around with. Like I, I said, um, I was doing a, another show like right before the announcement when stuff was like quote unquote leaking, but a lot of it turned out to be wrong. Like we need a class that wears mail and has a range DPS and a healing spec. Th th those are the niches we need to fill for, for if they're going to add a new class. And so I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy that they went in that direction. I mean, I know a couple of people on my team who are planning on maining it and they seem to be having a really good time, um, which, you know, I, I mean, obviously there's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be nuance. It's, I, I don't think it's going to be the, the, the spec for everybody. Cause it's, it, you know, it's just weird. It's got, it's got some weird stuff about it, but when you make those kind of bold choices and you put that stuff in a class design, it appeals to an audience, right? It, it has, it, it will find a niche when you give it the kind of tools that these, that these two specs have. So, um, uh, it's it's always a little spooky when we get a new class, right? Because everything gets so shaken up. But it's it's also usually fun to see it develop and and kind of find its place in the world. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm thrilled to uh, jump in on the new expansion, see what they do with it, and as you said, Slude, the the doors that have been open now towards them doing things like uh, the the different tiered spells for all the different classes, of depending on how long you're channeling it for, it doing more. I mean, I I can see even see it from a healing perspective. Of charging up a heal or having a heal be like imagine you know paladin flash heal for example right it could be something that is instantaneous and heals very quickly and for a, a decent amount or you could charge it up and and have that moment of you know the big bangs coming in and charge up that heal and land it just as the big hit happens and that that being the exciting factor so you could do same thing with wild growth for druids or whatever else you want to do having that ability to to really time out to a better degree um how you're going to line up with the with the incoming damage is is really nice and, and i know you know as well as i do that boss encounter timers can have some variance to them as to when things actually happen sometimes they could be a Slightly. second here second there um so it is nice when you if, if you could almost uh 
charge something up over time leading into it, leading into it so that it's, it's ready for just after the hit happens as opposed to trying to time it out so it lands just as the hit happens um that's always something that's uh that's nice so i i, I like the concept of uh, had, having that added to more classes and giving people more flexibility and in, in making sure that they're doing what they want to do in the the moment they want to do it as opposed to uh, sort of guessing based off of external add-on timers for things. Yeah, it adds a potential nice depth of gameplay too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to your example, flash of light is flash of light. Um, but if you add layers of flash of light, you know, it increases thought towards timing and exactly what you want to use for what situation it's just it's usually a good thing but you know there's always concerns with balance and that kind of stuff i mean sure. their plate is always constantly full now 38 specs and there's going to be outliers like yeah. Warrior. but yeah. it just it's just you know it's it's how it is and uh it's, it's a fine balance it always will be yeah well before we sort of start wrapping up let's just make sure people know what they should be you know keeping an eye on for when they actually start hitting max level this week um, there are obviously weekly quests that are going to be things that you're taking care of. Uh, the aiding the accord quest is a weekly one. So is the show your metal quest. Uh, there's the weekly Valdraken profession quests that you can pick up as well. And, uh, of course the weekly PVP quests that exist, uh, that we've you know talked about with, uh, you know, previous expansions. Those are probably still going to exist as well. Um, if you did do, uh, mythic plus stuff this past week or raid stuff this past week, you will not have a vault. Keep that in mind. There is no vault on Tuesday, so don't, you know, go running to your vault to try and grab something just before you start leveling or whatever's going on. Uh, You've been disappointed for the last time in yeah, Dead that's, so. that's right. <laughs> um, but uh, as far as uh, other things to keep an eye on, the Dragon Bane Keep Strongbox uh, from Siege of Dragon Bane Keep is also an epic quality reward that you can go for. Uh, so just, you know, keep your eye out for what there could be that you might be interested in grabbing. Yeah, one thing I think to um, to note with the weekly stuff, we kind of alluded to this earlier, none of this stuff turns on uh, the 29th, right? Like, uh, or the 28th, I should say. So tomorrow, yeah, yeah. right? Like if you zoom to 70, you cannot do Mythic Dungeon World Tour. You cannot do Siege and Dragon Bane Keep or Grand Hunt or Community Feast. You can't do the weekly quest. They're not going to be there until after weekly reset. And so... It, in NA, we're getting this weird little like bonus window of time that's, you know, yes, it's pre, we actually get to play pre the first reset of Dragonflight, right? So it's it's a kind of a weird uh, thing to consider. But I mean, if you want to zoom to 70, cool. You're just not going to be getting max level rewards for weekly stuff between November 28th and 29th, right? You'll get that weekly reset and you'll be able to do that stuff after Tuesday. Um, so just, you know, uh, and they clarified that like pretty specifically in a blue post and everything like this stuff will not be enabled on Monday night in NA. So don't, don't sweat it too hard. Enjoy the ride. You'll have all week to get your weeklies, you know, uh, after reset on the 29th. Mm. I guess the last thing we can touch on with Slute here before we start uh, saying goodbye is uh, UI element and uh, quality of life update stuff. Anything that stood out to you that you just loved that you saw them do? <laughs> As, as you say that, I'm currently um, very deep in weak ores. Um, from a baseline perspective, I think the UI overhaul is something that's needed to happen for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, I'm glad to see that they're finally, you know, getting in touch with more modern things like moving bars um, <laughs> and, you know, resizing elements. Um, uh, well, I was going to say jokes aside, but half jokes aside, right? It's yeah, needed to happen yeah. for a long time. There's definitely still some issues with it. For sure, it's not perfect. Um, I don't think they're nearly at the level that it will just replace add-ons purely. Um, I think for your average WoW player, for your average WoW player, it certainly replaced some things, uh, you know, whether it be some bar add-ons, etc. Uh, personally, I think they still have a long way to go with, you know, buff tracking and customization for those kinds of things, which are super important, especially, well, forever, I was going to say, especially for tanking with active mitigation, but really just for everyone, right? Like, yep. you want to know when spells are starting and ending and not have to sift through, you know, 500 little icons uh, changing places and then constantly being applied. Um, so I, I think the thing that gave me comfort, you know, listening to some of their interviews is, uh, and, and kind of just like crafting and, and just potentially like dragon riding and whatnot, 
it's it's a good first step in, in the right direction and, and building this kind of baseline uh, for them to expand upon. So the, the changes innately are great. Still, you know, a little bugginess here and there. Got some UI elements resetting and, and things like that. But hopefully they work those kinks out in the next 24 hours. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you know, it's long overdue. Hopefully they keep adding to it. Um, and it uh, it's, you know, people like it. Yeah, one of the biggest additions that I've uh, wanted for a little while that I, I, as you speak about, like, joking, not joking, moving bars and whatnot, um, is actually something they haven't done yet, which I hope they do. And it's making the chat window when you're typing messages not be one line that you can't see what you typed earlier as it scrolls off your screen and you have to sort of work your way backwards to see what you typed. I don't understand why they can't have an expanding text window when you're typing. It's the weirdest thing. It's existed since launch of World of Warcraft, and they have never touched it uh, outside of adding tabs to it. It's It's got to be one of those spaghetti code things it's where, gotta. you know, like the back, like if they touch that, like Sepulcher gets deleted, which may not be a bad <laughs> thing for Jason, I guess. Yeah. But... yeah. I'll take it. At this point, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll gladly trade uh, modern chat for Sepulcher's existence. Um, I mean, what? yeah, we're done with it, but. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the thing with the UI revamp is, like you mentioned, Salute, and I think this goes with the, the talent reworks and, and everything. Like, this stuff is all about sort of building, like, a new backbone for the entire game, right? Mm -hmm. And this is stuff that hopefully gets iterated on a lot going forward and sticks around for years to come. I mean, we saw a lot of iteration with the UI revamp over the course of Alpha and Beta. A lot of features came in pretty quickly and, you know, new options and, and everything like that. So... At some point, you know, during beta, they got to lock stuff in so they can localize it and get it ready to ship. And I think, you know, we'll, I, I would expect that we'll see more changes to it uh, in in the coming months and, and years and stuff. And I hope that's the case for all this stuff. I mean, I think it's a good, it feels like a much more modern game in a lot of ways as of, you know, Dragonflight and, and with the stuff that they're doing. And um, I hope it's something they can build off of, you know, they they made a lot of smart choices about, bringing some stuff more up to date in the context of how people play and expect games to look in, in this day and age. And also just, you know, rolling all the, all the coolness of world of Warcraft, like into your character. It's not about these external things that you're collecting or choosing or, or whatever. It's about, you know, how you want your character to play and, and what you want your character to be good at. I, I think that's a, a great place to start from. I think we needed that big kind of reset button. So um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think, what I want to see going forward is just, you know, I've, I've kind of used the phrase a lot during like all the sepulcher retuning, like keeping their, their hand on the dial, you know, um, just being ready to make those changes. I think we've seen like way more class balance changes in this pre-patch window than I ever expected. And I hope that means that they're going to continue to make changes and the talent system is like a, a vector for them to do that and to make changes more frequently. Like, you know, we'll see how it goes with encounter tuning and stuff. I, I mean, I, I feel like I, as a as a player and as somebody who is, you know, spending time in the game daily, weekly, like seeing those kinds of changes to all of these different elements, you know, class balanced uh, encounter tuning, even UI features and stuff like that. It, it feels like there's somebody on the other end that's trying to improve the experience that, that has, a, you know, that's looking out for players and wants to make the game fun to play. So, it's you know, I, I like it when I see a lot of hot fixes and changes and stuff, right? It's not like, oh, we'll see how busted this game is. It's, uh, my reaction is more like, oh, well, I'm glad that they're, you know, changing stuff all the time. And we've seen so much more of that in the last month than I thought we would. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to play a quick sounder for our patrons and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons. They contribute a ton to our show and help us to improve on the content we create. Today I'm giving a special shout out to Arajian, Celian, Infark, Kapawi, Mibble the Mighty, Nick, and Shoral. Thank you. This sounder is for you. You can find our Patreon over at patreon.com slash the starting zone. We have no new patrons to add to the list this week, but thank you very much to everyone who supports our show, particularly to those obviously we give a shout out to as well. Uh, our next patron episode is going to be early to mid-December when it comes to answering your questions and uh, maybe having somebody on the show to chat. Uh, we are just waiting for the, the Dragon Flight release to happen because I'm sure that's going to flood people's minds with things they want to know about and questions they want to ask. And so we're going we're gonna to let that happen and then we'll do a, a mid-December episode for all of that. 
But thank you again, patrons, to everyone who helps support the show. We're, uh, you know, it's it's always wonderful to know people care and want to listen to it and want to support it. Absolutely. I mean, we've done, man, we've done a lot of wow stuff uh, of late, especially since the Dragonflight announcement. You know, we've done a lot of episodes this year, and um, that includes bonus episodes. It mm-hmm. includes um, just surprise guests, like, uh, you know, getting to do interviews with Morgan Day and and it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work to get it all scheduled and it costs money to host that much audio. So, um, patrons, we appreciate you to help make the show the best it can be and hope everybody has a great time with Dragonflight launch, hoping for a smooth one and that we can all just know life at all week if we want to. Yeah. And if you folks have enjoyed this episode, you can consider heading on over to your iTunes, your Apple podcast, leave us a five star review. They really help out our show and we love reading the reviews here live. And actually this one, Salute, you'll have a little bit of, uh, of feedback on, which will be interesting to, to hear. Uh, this is from Sauce Master 6000 from Denmark. Uh, and it's titled The Best Podcast for Everything Ever. And it says, Jason and Spencer host the best podcast ever. All aspects of WoW are covered from Mythic Plus to casual MOG content. And it's my primary way of keeping up to date with what's going on in the world. I'm a casual myself, mostly due to time constraints, but I love feeling plugged into the world we all love by listening in every week. Thanks, guys. All the best. P.S. Also, should I play a druid tank in Dragonflight? I hear people say it's boring. Sad face. So uh, let's, you know, get an opinion there from Salute. <laughs> um, no comment. <laughs> um, it's... It, uh, how do I put this politely? Uh, Guardian Druid has needed um a substantial overhaul for a long time um and they didn't really get it this expansion uh they got some you know neat new things in the talent trees everyone did right um but ultimately guardian druid is guardian druid more or less um and they just kind of threw numbers at it uh, late game to make it work um so if you like druid the way it is now then you'll be getting more druid and you can actually hit mall and not feel too bad about it anymore uh, other than that, it's you know we're still waiting for for the old revamp for for our bear f- furry friends. Yeah, so just as far as rotationally, it's not as stimulating as some of the other classes go. It's kind of, eh. It's it uh, bear has always been, or for a long time at least. You know, I get a lot of people coming in. Hey, I'm new to tanking. What what should I start with? What should I play? Myself, a lot of other people always just go bear druid because. It's it's just it's very simple to to get a feel, you know, like one resource, very basic builders, very basic spenders, a lot of stuff's on the GCD. <clears throat> um, so, you know, there's some it, it's it's easy to, you know, keep pace with it now in terms of, you know, some other classes might compete in terms of tuning uh, with forgiveness. Right. Bears not always the strongest tank. So, you know, monks pretty forgiving in that, you know, they're very one dimensional with shuffle and stagger. Um, as far as their defensives go, but there's still more depth there than Druid a lot of the time. Warrior, obviously, I mentioned, very, very wildly overtuned defensively right now. So, you know, these classes are kind of forgiving in that sense. But from, you know, learning the basics, builder, spender, that kind of stuff, you, like, bears, those just your your baseline. Cool. Jumping from there. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Sauce Master 6000 for the review. We really appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully get some more five stars in that we can read right here. Yeah, absolutely. Sauce Master 6000. I I laughed so hard at your name. What a great uh, handle. <laughs> it and, is. Uh, super cool to hear uh, from a listener from Denmark. I mean, I, every time we get, uh, you know, international reviews, I have to remark, like, it's it's just amazing. You know, we get we hear from people over, all over the world who love the game and listen to the show. And, you know, they, they get some value out of their experience with the game via listening to the show. And it's uh, it's a bit humbling. You know, it's it's just great to hear from from people everywhere, you know, North America and beyond who, um, you know, they, they're, they're here to listen to this show for the same reasons that we make it. And that's really cool. So, uh, thanks for writing in. Yeah. All right. That's going to wrap up episode 553 of the starting zone. If you want to check out show notes for this episode or leave us a comment on the show, you can head on over to the starting zone.com, the official website for the starting zone podcast. If you want to con- contact the show or leave us your feedback or ask a question, you can email us at the starting zone at gmail.com or reach out to us on Twitter, or you can join our discord over at the starting zone.com slash discord and hop in there and chat and ask questions and hang out if you'd like. Uh, man, I am proud that we emptied our mailbag before we actually moved into this episode. It feels fantastic to have gotten <laughs> <Yeah>. through <laughs> all of the questions that we had um but it's uh, okay we'll be uh we'll be backed up with the mailbag in about two more weeks yeah i feel i feel like we're gonna have (laughs) another flood coming in for sure 
Um, so just for context, we we just finished up like uh, uh, reading emails. I think we got in about December. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, we were, holy dude. Yeah. We were this entire year behind because it's been a real roller coaster of a year for WoW news. I don't really think this coming year is going to be too much different. But uh, yeah, keep you know, we'll, if you write in, we'll definitely read your email and we'll get it on the show when we can. Yeah. Uh, and you know, obviously if you want a, a, a quicker response to things where it's not actually coming on the show, you can mention that inside your email, which will get us to, to answer it without feeling as though we need to, you know, find the, find the time or make the space, uh, on the show for doing it. Um, if you want to get your hands on some TSE gear, you can find that over at T public. That's T E E public.com slash stores slash the starting zone. And you can get all the sweet designs and shirts and mugs and stickers, that sort of thing. And, uh, salute, I'm going to start off with you. Where can folks find you in this crazy, ridiculous week of World of Warcraft that's about to happen? Uh, well, in the Dragon Isles, of course, Spencer. Oh, uh, but aside you. from that, on uh, twitch.tv slash salute, I'll be streaming more than is probably good for me at this age. Um, and you can always follow me on, twi or on uh, Twitter at, uh, at salutebag. That's usually where I do my main social media Regardless of uh, the Elon Musk takeover, I'll be there. Excellent. Excellent. And yeah, just uh, feel free to hop on over to his Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash salute. And, uh, you know, tune in, watch. He's very, you're very interactive. You answer lots of questions. You like interacting with chat. And uh, I'm, do, you, do you have new, like, dragon alerts? Are we going to have dragon alerts happening? You know, it didn't work out this expansion. Okay. So I think it'll be, uh, well, I, I don't want to make it expansion one. I don't want to say, well, you know, two more years of the basic alerts. So I think I'll aim for a 10.1, but there's just too much going on. Yeah. I hear that. Yeah, it's it's been we, we wanted to do a lot of graphical revamp stuff, too. And it's there's just a lot going on. So we'll get there. It'll happen. Uh, Jason, where can folks find you on the Internet? Uh, the best place to find me, as always, uh, continues to be Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald. And I kind of like Salute said, I'll be there until maybe there's no there there to be on. But you can find me over there for now. Um, you can also find me streaming WoW over on Twitch.tv slash Shieldwald and YouTube.com slash Shieldwald. Although I will be participating in the support of streamer program for the the pet that starts so monday at 6 p.m eastern and also drops will be going on this week so i think no youtube co-streams this week I, I want people to have an opportunity to get their drops and maybe if they want to support my channel get a get a pet for themselves so find me on twitch this week i'll probably be streaming a lot um just because whatever i'll hang out level up some tunes and, and do my thing so stop on by if you want yeah. if you're trying to find me you can find me on twitter at spencer underscore downy over on twitch at twitch.tv slash spencer hd or yeah I, I have that youtube thing too that i am slowly kind of doing something with at some point there's really really old boss kill videos on there at the moment uh youtube.com slash at spencer hd um salute are you planning on doing any youtube guide slash impression stuff in this first week um i've been it's uh, you know i'm in the same boat as you guys uh I, we, we all got to beef up that youtube and get that content out um I, nothing planned but the answer is probably because oh. social pressure and it's just it's an easier media format so i don't have to answer the same question about what the best tank is five million times i could just go and hey, go watch the youtube video instead yeah perfect all right with that for oh wow I'm, I'm the one who has to cough I'm sorry. I've spread it to you. All right. For that, for Jason, myself, and for Sloot, we want to say thanks for listening and jobs done. <laughs>